It is very common in band structures to have minima or maxima in the bands at k equals to zero, that is, at the centre of our band structure diagrams. In fact, the Cramer's degeneracy essentially ensures that there are band minima or maxima, since otherwise the bands cannot be symmetric about k equals zero. It's also common to have other minima or maxima in the band structure for example, the most important minima in the conduction band of silicon are not at k equals zero, and the same is true for germanium. Of course, by definition, any band that we draw in k-space has to have minima or maxima somewhere. That's just a consequence of drawing a curved line that has to repeat itself as we continue into other Brillouin zones. Wherever they are in k-space, the minima in the conduction band and the maxima in the valence band are very important in the operation of both electronic and optoelectronic semiconductor devices. Any extra electrons in the conduction band will tend to fall into the lowest minimum, and any absences of electrons in the valence band will tend to bubble up to the highest maximum in the valence band. We tend to call those absences of electrons holes, so we can think of those as bubbles that bubble up towards the maxima. The properties of most electronic devices and many optoelectronic devices, especially light-emitting devices, which involve recombination of electrons in the conduction band with holes in the valence band, are dominated by what happens in these minima or maxima. In optoelectronics, many other devices, such as some optical modulators, work for photon energies very near to the band gap energy. Their properties are also determined there by the behaviour of the electrons and the holes in these minima or maxima. It's therefore very useful to have approximate models that give simplified descriptions of what happens in these regions near band minima and maxima. Fortunately, there are such models, and they are very useful in practice. One of these is the effective mass approximation. If you've ever worked on the principles of semiconductor devices in the past, you will most likely have come across the idea of effective mass. And you will also most likely have wondered, where does that idea come from? How can the electron have a mass that differs from its real mass? Well, here, hopefully, we're going to solve that mystery. We're going to see just where that idea comes from, and therefore, what it really means. Near to some minimum, or some maximum, the energy E should vary approximately proportionately to k squared. In other words, this must look at least near to the maximum and near to the minimum, sort of like a parabola simply because it's a minimum or a maximum. For simplicity here, in the derivation we're going to do, we'll just presume that this variation is isotropic, that is, that this parabola has the same curvature in all directions. And we're also going to presume for simplicity that this minimum or this maximum we're talking about is located near to k equal to zero. Now, neither of these simplifications is actually necessary for this effective mass approach, and indeed, in some semiconductors, such as silicon and germanium, for the conduction band, we would have to change these assumptions. But this will be how we will approach the problem here. We'll take these simplifications just to keep the algebra simpler and to get the basic point across. So, this isotropic k equal to zero minimum or maximum is a good first approximation, in fact, for the lowest conduction band and the highest valence bands in direct gap semiconductors that are important for optoelectronics, such as gallium arsenide or the alloy semiconductor indium gallium arsenide. In silicon or germanium, which are indirect gap semiconductors, we have a situation that's a little bit more like this one here, and there are other indirect gap semiconductors, such as aluminum arsenide. The minima are not at k equals zero in the conduction band. 
and they are not isotropic. That is, the curvature of the parabola in this direction is actually different from the curvature in the other directions, which in this diagram would be out of the plane of the screen you're looking at. So silicon and germanium and aluminum arsenide are indeed quite generally materials that have their minima away from k equals zero tend to have non-isotropic curvatures here. The theory, however, is easily extended to cover these cases, though we are not going to do that here in this simple introduction. If the energy at one of these minima or maxima itself is some amount that we could call V, so this is the energy at the centre of these parabolic band minima or maxima, then, by assumption, the energy E, with a subscript K on it here, of the state in the band at this wave vector K is given by this parabolic expression. The separation of the energy at some value k compared to the value at the centre of the band, that is at k equals zero, is just going to be proportional to k squared. For reasons that are going to become obvious, we will choose to write this proportionality with a particular constant in here, which we're going to call an effective mass. But basically what we're saying is that the variation of E relative to the energy at k equals zero is proportional to k squared, and we've just chosen to call that coefficient here h bar squared over 2 times an effective mass parameter. So this effective mass parameter is simply a parameter that sets the appropriate proportionality. When we did our band structure calculation, we deduced what the form of this actually was. We had evaluated in principle energies for each of the k values, and near a minimum or maximum, it just happens to be parabolic, and we choose, therefore, to describe that parabola with this effective mass parameter. The reason why we can do this is that the energy is proportional to k squared relative to the value at k equals zero. So this effective mass is merely a parameter that we choose to use to describe the band structure we've already, in principle, calculated. So a relation such as this one here is what we would call a dispersion relation between the energy and the k value. And this particular approximation that we're taking here for the behaviour of the energies in the band is called, for obvious reasons, an isotropic parabolic band. So it's parabolic since, by assumption, the energy is proportional to k squared in its separation from the bottom and it's isotropic. There's no variation of this parabolic expression as we look in different directions. No matter what direction k is pointing in, this expression is the same. That's the isotropic part. Mm -hmm.